<laughs> Welcome to Parrot Literary Corner. Uh, as usual today is going to be fantastic. Uh, I've shown you earlier that um, today we're having uh, a unique spoken word artist and poet. And with me, as usual, is Dustin Pickering. And our guest is Paul Rickman. My name remains Mochi Olawi. So before we go deeply to this um, program, I want us to just have a little bit taste of our guest today. So technically, we're going to be having one of his uh, uh, one of his presentations in the past, which is titled "People Dying in the Streets." Enjoy. I said, do you know that there are bodies in the street? And they asked me what day it was. And I said it was Monday. And they said there's always bodies in the streets on Monday. I said, what do you mean? And they said, a long weekend. There's no job. The new week isn't bringing any hope. And there goes the plane, the arguments. And yeah, you're finding bodies in the street. I asked my friends, what should I do? What can we do about the bodies in the streets on Monday? They said, is it upsetting you? And I said, yeah, I don't want to walk around in the streets trying to get my latte and I have to walk over all the bodies. They said, why don't you go get a latte on Tuesday? I don't think there's any bodies in the streets on Tuesday. Thank you so much. I think that is the end of the uh, presentation with regards to uh, people dying on the streets. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Dustin, who is going to thoroughly um, handle this uh, show today. So Dustin, it's over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, my first question will be uh, for Paul. Um, so you organize festivals, or you have in the past. Uh, what what kind of energy do you put into it? What what sort of um, time consuming do you do for the preparations? And you know, maybe if someone else wanted to, in the future, prepare for a festival uh, in their town or in their area. Um, what kind of thing can they expect from that? Okay. First of all, thanks for having me here on the show. Uh, I hope that uh, that video played a little better for some folks. That was when I was in Sweden uh, in, in Frederick's home studio. 
Um, I have a YouTube channel, so check out. There's lots of great footage of me uh, performing. And yes, a side of myself is that I do, uh, I've, put, I've had weekly, I mean, monthly readings and stuff. Uh, you have to have a passion. I'll start there. If you don't have a passion for wanting to have an event or you're not having a sense that this is something that really means something to you to create a space for yourself and other poets or other writers to have audiences, uh, then, you know, you're not going to follow through on everything because you're not going to be able to get everything on the list if you're planning ahead about what you need to do. The list just keeps going on and on and on. And you're going to have to come you're going to have to come up with your own skills because you might say, oh, really? I got to make posters? No, I have to have a web presence. Oh, okay. Am I uh, filming this? Oh, what, what, what's the venue? And, you know, am I getting free venues? Am I paying for the venues? And, you know, I don't know if you guys, when I, my festival is 10 years old, but, uh, and, you know, some have been going on for much longer than me. And, but I remember in the beginning, if I went to a restaurant or someplace and then they had a ballroom and I'd say, I'd like to have this space for my festival. They would say, oh, yeah, okay, the poets can have those back two tables over there, you know. I was like, no, no, I don't want the back two tables. I want the ballroom. And they'd be like, what for? I mean, who's going to show up? I mean, you know, what do you mean? Poets are going to use the ballroom? And so some of it is just even <laughs> convincing people that, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we, this is like having a band, except I'm going to bring the audience. And uh, so sometimes, you know, you have to put up all the money and secure it and, you know, so that they don't feel any... Um, uh, you know, that there's uh, any cost to them. Uh, you have to make it also uh, have everybody feel that something's getting out of it. So, you know, venues get advertising, they, they're they selling food, it's convincing your folks that are coming not just to have water and lemon. Um, you know, they need to like, you know, buy something there to support those folks because, um, you know, especially here in the Massachusetts, we have some nice months, but, you know, I have a lot of time where you're not doing outdoor events, so you got to have an indoor event. If, and I could go on on that in terms of all that, but that's the first general thing. Have passion that you want to make it happen, uh, and you have to have some connections to folks. Otherwise, how are you going to get folks there? I mean, you know, I went to a lot of festivals, so I'd meet other people. When I'd meet them at those festivals, I'd say, hey, you know, would you come to my festival? And so then you try to build up, uh, you know, your connections to those folks. Uh, sorry, That's before you move, you move on, uh, Dustin, our, our viewers may not be happy with us if we fail to um, go deeply into who is really our guest. And I think it should be the right person to, let, to tell us who he is, why uh, we are having him on the show. Um, we know him as um, from our own side. Uh, we know him uh, we've been in the same platform together. But I believe our viewers want to know who exactly Paul Richmond is. So please tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, let's see. I've been trying to figure that out for 69 years who Paul Richmond is. <laughs> and uh, uh, if, you know, if I, I'll look around here in my room for some clues. Um, who I am is, uh, I, uh, well, one thing is uh, I've been an independent or um, a self promoter uh, for a very long time. I was a, a a live performer in terms of I was an entertainer, juggler, circus arts for many years. And so I had a lot of stage time. I always wrote. And so I was writing all the time and little stories. And when I really decided to uh, put out my writings and then go to festivals and word events and poetry readings, uh, people told me that I had that little bit of that edge because most writers are in their rooms writing and they don't have a history of being on the stage. And so I was, uh, I bring to my writing uh, the performance part. A lot of people may just feel that they're writing to have it be read. Uh, I, and I do that too. I have six books out and stuff, but I'm really thinking more about stage presence with either me doing it or I do it with bands or, uh, or if I meet other musicians who want to be doing that. So um, that's kind of more of who I am. And I want to speak the truth. I feel I want to get things out there that uh, are important to be thought about uh, because I think it's dialogue that matters. And the reason I do my other events to bring in other people is I think having and finding your voice is the most important part to keeping a free um, democratic society if we really want to, is that what we're shooting for? Because you have to have a voice and you have to feel strong in your voice and you have to want to communicate your voice and you want to be able to hear other people's voice. So I think poetry readings that say, you know, I'm going to listen to you and you're going to listen to me. We're going to get our five minutes or whatever that is. 
that's an important aspect that we don't see in our society. We're just, you know, it's my side or your side or it's my side and highway or something, you know. So that's just a little bit. I cover a lot of things, uh, you know, in terms of all that. Uh, um, and I, I love being creative. So that's kind of the person I am. I just noticed that your um, the piece that we shared is it's has a political edge to it. Speaking of democratic society, and uh, do you think that in terms of voice and poetry and finding your voice, uh, you mentioned that that's a very powerful aspect of the society. How do you think that factors into, say, like uh, the actual political system at large? Well, I, I just I actually just did a piece recently, which was based on something that I had been thinking about a lot and I had been asked. Uh, so, you know, I grew up uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, you know, Woodstock concerts, all that stuff. And uh, at some point, late 70s, there was a big movement that people classified as the personal is political. And uh, in the last couple of years, I had some young folks come up to me and ask me, you know, oh, were you one of those people who thought the personal was political? I mean, and did you wear bell bottoms? And, you know, as if it was all kind of a fad. And so I remember talking to them and looking at them and saying, hey, um, it's interesting. Um, you, what are those shoes? Oh, those are uh, hemp shoes. You know, you're a vegan and you're this and you're that and a whole list of things. And I said, well, then you're into the personal is political. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, all those things you chose, how the food you eat, the kind of clothes you wear, how you live, how much you consume, those are personal decisions you make and they have bigger consequences on the society as a whole. Uh, you know, if I need a house with 20 bedrooms and five bathrooms and it's just me, there might be some question to why and what is that doing to the environment and like that. So I think that, um, you know, it's important in terms of, uh, I don't, when someone says to me, oh, are you gonna do poetry? I hope you're not gonna do anything political. And I think, what, what, what do you mean by that? You know, uh, you want me to talk about puppies? You want me to talk about puppy farms? I mean, what do you want me to do? Um, and so I, can't, I think there's some things there that um, you could say, oh, everything isn't political. It's like, well, no, maybe it is. It's not, it's not the elections. It's not the right. corruption we're talking about. We're not talking about paying off, um, but it, we're talking about how I decide to live and how I eat my food and how I consume all that. You know, and, and my relationships do, am I free to love who I want? Am I free to be how I want? Am I free to, um, and you know, writing about, and do I understand what roles might be put on me because I'm a man and a white man and what, what's happened to me in terms of my history and to really understand that. And right. to me, that'll be political, you know? I don't know if I, I would jumped around there in terms of your question, but that's no. I think that was that was a very good answer. Um, you you know, I think we're experiencing in America a sort of um, political depersonalization, you know. And uh, if you observe that as well, and do you think poetry can sort of reconstitute our focus? I think that I mean. So think of it as to me when I was living in. Uh, a town that was called Cheektowaga it was just the beginning the outside the city limits of Buffalo. When I would get a, an album, you know, we used to get records then. When I got an album and I would listen to the words, it was like a letter from some other place telling me about things that were happening that weren't maybe happening where I was. And I remember coming across some poets or books and words, and it's a way that we learn. So Yes, I think that right now everyone's so discouraged about certain things. And, you know, we just had a leader who we lost count after, what, 27,000 lies, how many lies he's actually did. So, you know, it gets to a point that does the truth matter? And am I saying the truth now? Do you believe what I'm saying now? I mean, and what makes right. you think that I'm telling the truth? And so I think uh, why, like, various storytelling, true stories, and people going to real readings. I mean, what my folks, my audiences say to me is like, wow, that was real or, oh, that meant something to me. Or I, that, you know, that was like, or, you know, I, I really, I can understand someone thinking they were doing the right thing and they found out it was the wrong thing. And so people want real life experiences to hear what's going on, to verify their life, to help them change themselves, help them realize it's not easy for everybody. So, you know, in our work as poets or writers, you know, we're bringing all that up, you know, the loss, the, the sense of encouragement, the sense that we're, you know, we had hopes and dreams and did we make them? And, you know, where did we get those dreams from? Are they really our dreams or were they manufactured in capitalism? And, you know, that's where we think we should be dreaming, you know? 
That's an excellent answer. Um, you know, I'm thinking, um, does this factor also into your publishing, the the, the, the politics and the political as personal? Uh, you do uh, human error publishing uh, as well. Is there a focus? Is there like a mission for the for the uh, company? Yeah, in some ways, I mean, we to honor Fern Getty, who just, you know, we lost. <laughs> in a way, I didn't realize, I, I just did it on my own. And then I read some things about what he was doing of why he published. Um, I don't, I sort of, saw for myself that, okay, this was limited. And maybe because of being like a performer, you know, as a juggler to get hired, I'm not, you know, someone isn't coming and knocking on my door and going, hey, uh, you know, will you juggle for us? At, you know, no, that's not happening. I have to reach out to folks and depending on how you can reach out. And I started to see rejections from my own work and then other people work. And then I started to realize, hey, I'm going places and people are I'm, I'm doing well in front of audiences and people are asking me for my book. Uh, technology has a big effect of changing all this. You know, uh, 20 years ago, you couldn't put out your own music album. You couldn't suddenly have your own station. You couldn't publish your own books. They tried to make it seem like self-publishing was something of, you know, that you weren't worthy or you weren't real professional. I mean, I remember being turned on in 1970s, like Ed Sanders and a lot of people who, you know, I got a mimeograph machine. I could, you know, I, I, a, a box of paper of 500. I suddenly published 500 pieces of poetry and could hand it out. Wow. Um, so that was self-publishing, you know what I mean? So now human error publishing, I don't, uh, I, when I see people I like, I ask if they're being published, if they've been rejected and I'll publish them. Uh, people who come to me and say, I have a book and I don't, nobody else wants it. And I'll say, do you want to put it out? And I'll help them put it out. Uh, I don't read through a book and go, okay, I don't I like this necessarily. I mean, I don't go for fascism or sexist stuff or, you know, something that's, you know, a racist or, um, but I don't, there may be many things that I've, people I've published that I read that, I, I you know, I, I liked and some things I didn't necessarily like when I'm publishing and working with them. Uh, it comes from my theater background of who I trained with, who not everyone trains the same way. And it's, I want to be a mirror to you. So if you came to mm -hmm. me and you read me the piece and I said, okay, that uh, I get it, that it's about this. Is that true? And if you said, yeah, if, or if I said something else and you go, no, that's not what it's about. And then I would say, well, that's what I'm getting. So I'm not going to change it. How do you want to change it? Or do you want to change it? Maybe it's just me. I think you should ask. When you say that, does everybody think that the sky is black and it's, you know, all dire or you were telling me it was sunshine and that it was, you know, beautiful. So, um, we, you know, maybe that's a problem. So you might decide to keep going with it or you may say, oh, no, OK, I get it. So human error publishing is there. And also I'm set up to make hopefully the artist gets the writer gets the most money up front. Uh, I only take I take two dollars a book. Uh, I'm not. Um, you know, so when people order, they get their books for about, say, five to seven dollars. They're being sold for 15. Most publishers, people have to buy the books at ten dollars or something or twelve dollars. So they're not making very much. I just got an email from someone saying, hey, please buy my book because the publisher won't publish it unless there's pre-sales. And and I kind of understand some of that because it's a business. I'm not doing it as that as a business. I'm doing it to help people get their word out for them. And each author has their own audience. Maybe it's only 30 people. Maybe it'll be 50 people. Maybe it's 200 people. Maybe it's thousands of people. I mean, we're living in a different age now. The fact that, you know, you can be where you are and I'm here and we're having this talk, you know, all of a sudden I can be selling my book or, you know, I went to Senegal. I could have my book being sold there where before I didn't have that opportunity or, in Sweden, where that movie you just played, I mean, I went to that festival and sold books there. Who would have known I would have been in Sweden selling books, you know? But if I don't have a book, I couldn't sell it. So right. when I see when I see authors, I say it's part of, maybe it's my thinking of having a show. It's my thinking that if you're serious about being an author, people are gonna come up and ask you for your work. It's very true, I think. Uh, so, you know, Part of the, you know, being a poet and an events coordinator and getting involved with other people, do you find there's challenges to that or do you find that it's very easy to mobilize people towards a specific goal? <laughs> okay, let's see. 
Uh, I try to keep my addictions down and get the prescriptions in to maintain and the bar is always open. But um, I mean, you know, we're talking about people. Right. So say out of 170 poets that come to my one of my years, I had maybe 175 people who came to read uh, and wanted to participate in any group that you're in out of the say 180 folks, 20 or 30 or some number is really solid. They get it. They saw what you did. They want to participate. They, they'll ask to help move chairs. They'll do something because they know what's going on and maybe they do it in their own place and they're there to make it work. Other people stroll in like, hey, you know, I'm the star here and what are you doing for me? And, um, you know, I've had people come to my festival and, and not tell anybody they're reading. And it's like, well, how, you know, and then they'd complain because they had no audience. It's like, well, do you think people know you or do you think I'm creating your audience? All I'm doing is I'm creating venues for you. We're doing this together. I mean, it's a whole lot of work. I mean, one oh, a number of years, actually, maybe in four or five of the years of my festival, I would have six or seven venues happening all at the same time. So my festival ran for anywhere from four to six days. And so on some of the nights at seven o'clock, there was six or seven places you could go to in town within walking distance to be in a venue of reading. And then at nine o'clock, there was one venue to bring everybody back together, a big venue. And sometimes people complain, well, there's seven venues. Who's going? I said, a lot of people. I mean, a lot of the venues were full, uh, but other venues aren't. Did you do anything to help people get to your venue? Well, okay. I, you know, that's uh, what it is. Um, and so, you know, I think you have to separate some things out. As I said, um, if your mission is to help support writers and also myself, I mean, I realized when I started to really want to do this, Austin was a really good festival, mm -hmm. international thing. They're having trouble now though. But there were a lot of really great festivals out there. Uh, but also I realized there wasn't a lot happening around where I was. And if you don't have venues, then you have to be in the mindset of, well, I guess I'll wait till it happens. And you know, you can have that attitude about life. I guess I'll wait till someone offers me a TV show or something, or or you create it, you know, or you know, you say, no, no, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a venue. I'm gonna, you know, then I can read at it too. Oh, I'll get 10 of my friends to read at it. Oh, okay, there's only four or five people showing up. Oh, no, now there's 20 people. Oh, there's no, 50 people. Oh, we got to move to a new space. We got a lot of people coming, you know? Wow. And in that, you start, you know, in that, you start to see, oh, well, should it be a bar? Should it be a coffee place? Do we need food? Um, can we get people to be quiet? I mean, I, I came up with sand timers because I watched too many venues of people arguing and trying to get people off the mic and people not respecting, we just said you had five minutes, you know, you're into 10 now and you're acting like you're going to go for a couple more pages. I mean, we only <laughs> have so many people here tonight, you know what I mean? And I wanted to also democratize that. I didn't want it to be like, I have to go up with the hook. I wanted it to be that the audience and all of us said, hey, we're playing a game here, like any game. See these timers, when you walk up, as soon as you come up, you flip it. And when that sand is gone, you're gone. Even if you're in the middle of the heartbreak hotel, I'm sorry, we'll hear it next time. You know what I mean? This is just where, what it is. And, you know, uh -huh. people balked at it for a while. Sorry to and then they you. started. I, I ought to ask you a question, but before we get to that question, yeah. I want our viewers to watch this. Who works for who? Why oh, okay, who inspired great. you to write a poem? Why did you write a poem? So, uh, before you say anything, let our viewers enjoy a little bit part of this uh, um, uh, very wonderful presentation. Enjoy. Yeah, great. Thanks for showing it. Yep. without accountability, how do we stop them? Who's going to tell them? You can't kidnap people off the street. I mean, where are the police? Why aren't the police stopping these kidnappings? Who works for who? Who works for who?
people are in the street. They want to change. Stop the violence, the racism, the hoarding of wealth, stealing from the poor. Stop raping the earth and everyone on it. 2020 police brutality, police violence, a civil rights violation, excessive force, beatings, a cry for justice only brings more vicious beatings. Early records suggest labor strikes were the first large scale incidences of police brutality in the United States. Great Railroad Strike of 1877. Holman Strike of 1894. Orange Textile Strike of 1912. The Ludlow Massacre of 1914. The Great Steel Strike of 1919. And on and on and on. That's right, hey, thugs now are dressed militarized. The PR machine for the military says it's given the military a bad name. Right. Um, I think um, we've got the the beat, the whole uh, presentation is very, very clear, very simple, very straightforward. Uh, and I believe that um, something must have pushed you to write this. This was 2020. Tell us a little bit about this before Dustin will ask you all the questions. Um, first of all, these things just don't happen. So this is after a number of years of me, various kinds of collaboratives and meeting Nigel many years ago who put together the video. So after interacting with all kinds of things, you know, I wrote the piece and after, and then the band do it now is a bunch of people that were have in my valley that after many, many years, I called together and asked to think about a project I wanted to do. And we started to do some things and it took off. And so then all those things came together, first of all, in terms of how that happened. Uh, I am trying to figure out how to make things simpler uh, in terms of uh, what we're talking about. And that hit me when I started to hear about um, representatives in government, uh, the police, various people that we hire that were community workers that we're paying for. And it becomes a question, who works for who? Uh, and if you know, you're not, we all want the $15 raise or we all want health care. And everybody keeps saying we want health care and the representatives say to us, we're not giving you health care. I suddenly have to ask, wait a minute, excuse me. I thought, I thought we uh, voted you in to be doing what we are hoping democratically we wanted. So not to take more money from us, not to, <laughs> you, for you to make money and us not to have money uh, could go on there. But also I wanted to give history there. If we watch the whole piece that when people think about police brutality, this isn't new. Sometimes they always act like, oh my goodness, they're beating people. Well, if you're a person of color, you've known they've been beating people for you know a long time. And if you are a labor person, you know that police have been brought in for a long time, stopping people from trying to have better working conditions and better pay. None of this is new. We have made strides. And so again, as Dustin was asking, I try to use my poetry to keep bringing things back up without, you know, you don't want to, it's not a lecture. I'm not trying to have you join to be anarchist or communist or whatever you think, or the big socialist words, you know, everyone's fearing. Uh, we live in a capitalist. I'm trying to ask what is the right thing to do? So that became the most easiest way to ask it of, you know, who works for who are we, you know, how are we doing this? A very interesting question and it's a good interrogation of reality and the realities we face uh um i'm just thinking you know uh, how how did you come about with all that that kind of footage in the the artistic direction of the of the video that was really interesting i, I love the presentation uh once again it's a kind of uh how much you can 
control. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's, I mean, if I'm the one painting, then I decide, okay, I've erased the numbers in the painting and I'm deciding to put blue where they told me to put orange, you know, and, um, and I'm, that's what I decided. Um, that's why I mentioned, um, Nigel is an amazing video artist and he does other things, also a singer and has his own bands and all kinds of things. Like I said, over the years, uh, and some things you trust, like what, with that band, they don't know many times what I'm going to talk about. So it's more like jazz. When we get up there, somebody starts something and they're listening to me and I'm listening to them and we're running. And then afterwards, somebody goes, wow, that was you know, pretty amazing how you put that all together. It's like, yeah, we're kind of amazed about it also. Um, mm -hmm. So when I, when, when, when I had that track, I sent that track to Nigel, not thinking about him doing a video at all. We trade work all the time and encourage each other and get feedback from each other. That's another important thing you want. You want people who will tell you the truth. I like that. Uh, you, you know, I, I didn't really like that. Uh, I remember sitting at a table one time, a friend of mine came down from the stage and we were sitting with a bunch of people and many of us didn't know each other. And uh, I asked them about something in their presentation where I thought it dropped. And one person at the table kind of said to me, you know, geez, why, you know, they just got a standing ovation. Why are you attacking them? And I said, I'm not attacking them. And that person said, I don't feel attacked. They actually got a pretty good eye because that is where I dropped it. I just continued. I didn't know what to do there. And so then we had a little conversation and then through that conversation, they go, oh, I know what I want to say there. You know, about two nights later, they redid that piece and made that change. And it was like, they got a bigger standing ovation. And wow. so, you know, it's a kind of thing where you got to be willing to have people that you're hearing and want to change. So I just sent that like with that. All of a sudden I hear from Nigel, I'm doing a video for this. And I said, oh, okay, well, let me, you know, let me know. And all of a sudden I get that video. <laughs> so it was like, wow. okay, thank you very much. Uh, that works. Um, and then we've talked more about, okay, let's collaborate. But I think people have to realize that those things, they don't just happen. You make them happen. You can't count on them happening. Uh, if you were to plan on that happening, you wouldn't have the $10,000 or the amount of money to make it happen so then you think it can't happen and life doesn't always work that way you are out there trying things and you find people who want to do things with you and you do things for them and and then you all grow and then you all get your work out and then something happens where hopefully maybe you're just happy with the satisfaction that happened or suddenly there is there are sandwiches being handed out for what you did you know what i mean wow that's interesting. Uh, I think um, I was going to ask, you know, and all of these collaborative efforts you've uh, helped produce and put together, has there been a really interesting moment of synchronicity in any of that, uh, that that really stands out to you? Well, I would say, you know, the band, Do It Now. I mean, I sort of feel like, uh, well, on all of it, I think is what's important is that you, learning to trust yourself, learning to trust what you're telling yourself to do. I mean, if you sit with yourself and say, you know, I want to do this, or, I mean, we're given a lot of movies of what we think we're supposed to, you know, like when growing up, you're supposed to go to the junior prom or you're a loser or the senior prom, or you're supposed to get married in this way with all these increments and how much money you spend. If you try to step out of whatever that movie or script is, then you get questioned and all kinds of things, but you're trying to find out for yourself, where do you want to go with what you're doing? I mean, I realized that I had gotten to a place where I wanted to do more stuff with music. I had always done some other things. I saw that people did those things. Suddenly I thought, hey, I know these musicians. They're really, really good. Oh, I found out none of them for whatever reason played together. They had wanted to play together. They were all very you know, known in their own field. So when I said to them, you guys want to just get together for an afternoon. I want to talk about something and bring your instruments. And, uh, and also I presented it in such a way that I'm not expecting, I wasn't expecting them to give up their projects. They're all very accomplished musicians and they're all have zillions of projects. And I was just asking them to do a project with me for whatever period or whenever it could happen. And then when they saw, they got excited about it because it really clicked. They're really glad to be playing with these other people who they thought were really good. They really liked what was going on. So they opened a little more space for that to happen. It doesn't always happen. And, you know, I can't 
I try not to hold on that it's going to go here or it's going to go there or I mean you can't I mean I don't I don't really know what's next you know I'm suddenly I'm finding myself doing these kinds of things I don't know where this will go who will see this or if anybody sees this and cares and goes to my band camp and buys something or ask me to come to perform or I just meet another really cool artist that two years from now, me and them do something that something hits. Um, and, I, and what does that mean? What does it mean it hits? I think that's a real important question for people mm -hmm. to ask. You know, are you hoping that, you know, your parents will finally go, okay, good job or, <laughs> or something else, you know what I mean? I mean, my parents, right. are, my, my parents are dead now. So I don't, there's not, that's not gonna happen unless they give me some signal from somewhere. But um, I, I and so that's I was asked, asking myself and talking to some friends today of thinking, you know, where, where, what is my vision? And then also not to hold on to it so tightly, but I need to be out there making something happen and then be aware. It's like when you're playing music, you know, I went over here, I thought I was going down a blues, but they started something else. And you go, oh, okay, I'll go there. And it's kind of like a, a, a Taoist thing almost, just like letting it flow into itself and, and things to happen naturally and spontaneously. And, and I think that's a really artistic approach to uh, just in everything in general. And uh, I think, I, you know, curious, how do you think when we talk about the politics and the economy, do you think there's a, a link or a bridge between a very healthy and stable economy and, and the arts in general? And, oh, totally. And the health of the art. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know we don't have too much time here, but I mean, one is it's not a passive thing. You are being active. Yes, right. I am watching the flow and I'm watching to see what's happening, but I'm being active and I'm creating and I'm trying to make something happen. And I'm not being bummed out by what I tried to create didn't happen. I'm looking to see what didn't happen and what where where's that was that mean? Yes, in terms of economy, because I mean, my festival and people realize people had to go eat. People want to be in the bar. They want to have maybe a few drinks. They had the park, uh, all kinds of things. So, you know, uh, th there's all kinds of economic things you don't, are not even aware of that happen. Right. A lot of people forget that about the art artistic endeavors and how they bring health to the economy. Uh, and I think that's an excellent point to, to, to kind of wrap things up with is that, you know, people forget how the arts and the economy are bridged together and how a healthy art scene and a healthy economy are sort of a feedback loop and they bring together, yeah, 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 you know, absolutely, you absolutely. spend more money. Uh, uh, yeah, it's very, definitely. very unfortunate. We would have loved to flow more and more. We have got a very wonderful <laughs> guest today. We really appreciate your time with us, Paul Richmond. Um, I Thank hope you, Paul. next time when we invite you, you will respond to us because we still have other things to do together on this same show. And uh, we appreciate you, our viewers. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, this is where we're going to put the cutting of the show today. Uh, next